Let me take this time to uh, welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're glad that you are able to join us from the comfort of your home. And I pray, God, that tonight our hearts will be stirred, not only to allow him to refresh us, but also to have that uh, uh, desire and, and excitement for his word to be diligent students of God's word, particularly as we go through this very difficult and challenging time in the history of our world, to know what God's uh, word uh, says uh, about uh, the situations that we face and to allow him to uh, refresh us as we come to him in prayer. And so tonight it is again my honor and my privilege as the associate pastor of Parkwood Baptist Church to uh, lead in this uh, Bible study, something that we do every Wednesday night, and also to thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we will begin with our time of prayer. Uh, what we do, for those of you who are new to our, our Wednesday night Bible study, we engage in what we call community prayer. Uh, a time in which we bring our concerns to the Lord, a time in which we uh, come with our, our challenges as well as with our praises. Uh, the standard prayer items that we have been uh, praying about uh, as we, uh, you know, when we used to meet before uh, the virus actually uh, kept us in our homes was first to pray for our elected officers, beginning from the uh, federal uh, level our president uh, and uh, his staff, uh, all the way to uh, our local level, obviously uh, remembering our state elected officers. Uh, and so we're going to pray for them, uh, especially uh, for God's uh, guidance and wisdom as they continue to lead and to guide us uh, through this very difficult and challenging time. We will also pray for our military men and women uh, there are many of them still stationed in harm's way around the globe and uh, we want to uh, commit them to the care and uh, to the safety of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will remember their uh, sacrifice uh, uh, through which or by which we are able to meet and enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy here in this uh, great land. And so we want to uh, just say thank you to their service and to pray for them and for their families. Uh, we will also pray for our first responders. Uh, we know what's going on in our country right now. They are actually on the front lines. And again, we would like to commit them to the safety of uh, the great Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, of course, we will also pray for our church family, particularly for our seniors, uh, the elderly among us, uh, as well as the young. I know this is a, a very difficult time for uh, uh, all of us, uh, for the young ones who can't step outside to play uh, and just to be with their friends. Uh, those uh, in our, our elementary, middle and high school, particularly our high schoolers who can't graduate or can't walk, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the procession to uh, receive their diplomas and obviously to say goodbyes to your friends as they uh, continue to uh, to college, and of course for uh, those in, in colleges, schools, and universities, uh, who obviously are also going through the same situation. So we're going to pray uh, for all of them, and of course uh, pray for the world. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer this time. And of course, uh, as we uh, always do, uh, the first uh, sixty seconds uh, will be a time of quiet, silent contemplative and, uh, you know, a time of meditation in which you can bring your own concerns and your own, um, you know, prayers and praises, you know, to the Lord. And at the end of that, I will then, uh, you know, commit uh, all that we've talked about, uh, get into our community prayer time. So let's just have this time of silence uh, in which we just petition God, uh, bringing our own concerns and those of our families to him.
as you uh, bring your uh, individual and personal uh, prayer time to a close, uh, for me to jump in and commit our community prayer uh, to the Lord, I just uh, want you to know that we serve a God who hears us when we cry out to Him, a God who receives our praises, a God who also uh, receives our concerns and the things that are very dear to our heart. And so, Father, we want to thank you for this time of prayer, a time in which we can come apart from all the things that continue to confound and to perplex us, and just to leave everything at your feet, at that altar of grace. We come, Father, first of all, asking that you will forgive us of all the things that we have done against your God and against one another. We acknowledge our sinfulness, our humanity, and we plead the precious blood of Christ that alone can wash us and make us feel. And Lord, we do that right now so that our, our communication, our prayer, will ascend to your throne of grace and that you, Lord, will incline your ears to our supplication. Father, at this time, I just want to lift our country into your hands. We bring collectively before you our elected officers from the federal all the way down to the local level. We pray for our leaders. We ask that you will give them divine wisdom and that, Father, you will guide them as they continue to guide us in this time of uncertainty and fear and trepidation. We ask of God that uh, you will remove from them any selfish instincts, but that all that they will do will be for the common good, to bring relief and to bring the assurance of your presence to your people. Father, we pray for their safety and we ask that you will continue to bless them. Bless their families and bless all that they do. We also would like to bring to you now military men and women who have put their lives on the line for us to enjoy the freedoms that we continue to enjoy in this great country. We ask, O oh God, that they would know how much we appreciate their sacrifices and all that they have, they're doing and they have done. Father, again, we ask that you will place a hedge of protection around them. And we ask uh, that, especially for those who are still in harm's way in different parts of the world, that, O oh God, your grace and your presence will be with them. And now, Father, we want to pray for our first responders who are particularly on the front lines at this time. Some of them have moved to different parts of our country where this virus is it's just decimating our, our land and, and precious lives. Father, we, we know the devastation that this uh, virus is causing. And so, Father, we ask that you will protect them too. As they put their lives on the line for us, a call to duty which they respond with grace. Father, we ask of oh God that the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God of creation, the God of redemption, will be with them and that he will protect them for us. Be with your families, of oh God, and may they be assured that you are with them all the way. And now, Lord, we want to pray for the health workers, our doctors and nurses, our EM workers, Lord, or all those who are working hard just to help those of us who have been afflicted and infected and all the lives that are being lost. Father, we again ask that this virus, which is no respecter of persons, but Father, you can bring it under control. We ask that you will be with our doctors and our nurses as they continue to uh, just sacrificially uh, do the work to which they are called. Master, you hear us when we call out and cry out to you. And we know you are, you know, listening to us and that you hear our cries of pain and anguish and that you, Lord, will respond. Father, we just want to pray for our church family here at Parkwood. You know our seniors and uh, you know our young ones and you know those in between. Again, Lord, as this virus continues to wreak havoc on all age groups, we just bring all our age groups into your hands, into your care. 
Master, we pray that you will visit with each one of us and our families, and that, Father, you will also impress upon us the uh, need to uh, heed the recommendations and the executive order that has been imposed uh, by our governor to protect us, that we will take these very seriously. Father, we pray for our seniors particularly. We ask that you will bless them and that you will be with them. We pray for our young ones. So at this time, it's very difficult for them because uh, they can't be out there to play with their friends and uh, they keep asking, Mom and Dad, when can we go out? But Lord, only you know. And so we ask that, uh, Jesus, you will just hear the cries of these uh, little ones that you love. For we remember when you walked on earth the first time, you loved children and you always took them into your arms of love and you blessed them. And so, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for those in schools, especially our, our, our high schoolers who should be graduating, but Lord, don't know what's going to happen. Some of them are confused and are, are just uh, not very pleased about it. But Lord, this is a special time. And so we ask that again, you will be with them. And Lord, it is your will that this uh, thing will come to an end, uh, an end and that they will be able to uh, just walk and, uh, and graduate and say bye to their friends as they move on to college. And for those in, in colleges and universities, again, this is a very trying and difficult time for them, for the faculty, staff, and for all those who, who work in our institutions. We pray that you will be with them. And our Lord will bring the concerns of our world. You know how this uh, virus is uh, destroying precious lives in different parts of our, of our world. We pray for those in Europe. We pray for those here in America and, and elsewhere in Africa, and in all the lands that you've made, that, oh God, your will will be done. But more importantly, may this time bring to us our own sense of mortality and our frailties as human beings. That there's only one person who knows what is going on, and that's Jesus Christ, the one who created us, the one who came down and redeemed us when we had sinned and were destined for death and for destruction. And so may we cast all our cares on you, knowing that you hear us. So be with our world, oh God, and be with us as we continue to supplicate you. And now as we turn to your word, oh God, we pray that your word, which is life, will continue to speak to our hearts and minds, and that tonight we will glean a very special message from you and get some lessons that will help us to live for you, to be about the work of the kingdom, and to know that you are with us all the way. And so, Lord, we just want to thank you for this time because we ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me uh, ask you to uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 18. We will be uh, there, the 18th chapter, 1-8 of the book of Exodus. Uh, we began from Genesis 1 and we've seen how God has been in the midst of all the things that we've been studying. For everything is about God. It's not about those characters or actors or, or individuals that we read about. God is the one who orchestrates, who makes things happen. And so we become instruments in the hands of the Almighty God to use us for God's glory and for our good. And so we need to understand this. Everything that God is doing and that we are called upon to do is first and foremost to the glory of God and of course for the good and for the betterment of, of this world. And so we've talked about Abraham and how God took Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph and trust God. Despite God's faithfulness, Israel continued to demonstrate a spirit of unfaithfulness. And so tonight, we're going to see how, again, God came in to help his chosen leader, Moses. Obviously, God had chosen him. And yet, God was still doing something to draw our attention, to see how God used Moses and how God used different instrumentalities to bring, uh, you know, uh, power and, of course, uh, uh, wisdom to Moses. And so tonight, we're going to study a leader's wisdom. That's the title. Moses, the wisdom that God gave him to actually lead the people of Israel. And so let me read the introduction. I have also said that if you uh, request uh, a copy of the handout or, you know, the material that is prepared for each Wednesday, 
I will be more than happy to, uh, you know, email that to you. So you can email me, uh, Daniel D at parkwood.org and just request, uh, you know, uh, for the handout or, or for the, uh, you know, material which we study each uh, Wednesday and I will, I will uh, forward that you know, to you. You can also request that through the church office. Uh, either way, uh, we will be able to share that with you. So let me read the introduction. Despite God's deliverance and provision, the people of God, that is the Israelites, continued to struggle with turning from their fears to trusting God. Now that's a summary of our lesson. Despite all the miraculous things that God did to deliver Israel and to continue to provide for them, the people of Israel continued to struggle with turning from their fears, does that ring a bell, to trusting in God. Tonight, this lesson is going to help us to turn from our fears. Yes, there are fears in this world and the devil will always come and try and create that situation which will put us on edge and make us fearful, even to the point of distrusting God. But the lesson tonight is going to help us to focus on what God did with Israel and to draw and glean some lessons from that to help us in this very present moment when fear is all over the place. As a result, they repeatedly, that is the people of Israel, they repeatedly grumbled against Moses and God. By grumbling against Moses, they were in effect also distrusting God who handpicked Moses, his chosen servant, to lead Israel out of Egyptian bondage into freedom, into liberty, into the promised land. They also even disputed with themselves, with one another. And so not only uh, in, in, in this uh, study tonight, not only are we going to see that the Israelites not only had issues with their leader Moses and of course their God, they also disputed with one another. See, up to this point on their journey, Moses had been the sole judge for all the people. Moses had been the only one who has been arbitrating and, you know, trying to resolve the issues. And this is a great multitude. Can you imagine Moses being the sole judge, taking all these responsibilities upon himself? But when Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, who we we'll read about tonight, met with Moses, Jethro, that is the father-in-law of Moses, Moses' wife's dad, gave the overwhelmed, the overworked leader, Moses, some much needed wisdom and proved himself to be a wise you know, leader in blessing the people of God and also preserving their unity. And so Jethro was able to offer some words of counsel and advice to Moses, something that would be a principle for us as the people of God and even for governments in our world you know, today. And so I particularly believe that this lesson tonight will help us not only to live as Christians, but also to live communally as uh, you know, nations and states and um, you know, uh, people that have come you know, together. And so, just as Jethro uh, proved to be uh, somebody who was able to offer good counsel to Moses through, again, the agency of the Spirit, through God's own uh, working, uh, and of, of course, uh, for Moses to be a blessing uh, to preserve the unity of Israel, I believe that similarly, God has provided us the church body. God has brought us together as his body, the church, with Jesus Christ as the head, to follow the godly counsel given to us, to work together to fulfill our task of sharing the gospel with the world and bringing others into his body. And so when all this that we're going through uh, is you know, you know, behind us, when this actually comes down and uh, COVID-19, obviously, we, you know, God through the scientists and all the great people that are working, we're able to find a cure and we come together. 
we should intensify our efforts to actually share the gospel of Christ with the world and through that bring others into a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so with this introduction, let me read to your hearing and again you can uh, follow me uh, in your Bible. This would be a good time for us as families uh, to kind of uh, huddle over God's word together. You can grab a Bible, or uh, each person, or as a family, we can look in one Bible as I read to your hearing from Exodus chapter 18. There are 27 verses, and I'm going to read through all of that because our lesson tonight is actually focused or centered on this uh, chapter. So here we go, Exodus chapter 18. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two, uh, with her two sons. The name of the one was Geshem, for he said, I have been a sojourner. So Geshem means one who sojourns, one who kind of lives on, on the way. In a foreign land, of course, they were uh, in, uh, in Egypt before they, they, you know, they moved. Verse 4, and the name of the other, other Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. So Eliezer means God's deliverance from the sword of Pharaoh. Verse 5. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of the Lord. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Verse 8. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to, to the Egyptians for Israel's sake. All the hardship that had come upon them in the way. We talked about the way last week. And how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro, this was his reaction. Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel. In that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. In other words, he showed his appreciation, his gratitude to God for the way God had dealt with Israel. God's providential care and of course the destruction that God brought upon Pharaoh because of Pharaoh's uh, stubbornness and his resistance to God's word. And so we go to verse 12. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? And all the people stand around from morning till night. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. In other words, they come to resolve their issues and they come uh, for me to uh, be uh, of help to them. When they had a dispute, 
they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws verse 17 Moses' father-in-law said to him what you're doing is not good you and the people with you will suddenly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you you are not able to do it alone now, that's really an important verse you are not able to do it alone now obey my voice i will give you advice and god be with you you shall represent the people before god and bring their cases to god and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do moreover look for able men from all the people men who fear god again that's another important uh, statement men who fear god men who are trustworthy and hate bribe and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands of hundreds of fifties and of tens and let them judge the people at all times every great matter they shall bring to you but in a small matter they shall decide themselves so it shall be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you words of wise counsel as we can see verse 23 if you do this god will direct you you will be able to endure and all these people also will go to their place in peace so moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law another important statement moses heeded he listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said moses chose able men out of all israel and made them heads over the people chiefs of thousands of hundreds of fifties and of tens and they judged the people at all times in a hard case they brought to moses but in a small matter they decided themselves then moses let his father-in-law depart and he went away to his own country i'm sure you heard the wise counsel that jethro the father-in-law of moses offered to his son-in-law moses you see the bible is filled with several a number of great leaders one of whom undoubtedly is moses perhaps the greatest and biggest star of the jewish world uh, i've shared with you before that two important uh, known worthies in judaism obviously we know uh, elijah and of course moses we talked about uh, david very important you know a person but in jewish uh, history moses and elijah are two important individuals in the history of israel you remember at the time of jesus's transfiguration these two appeared with jesus elijah and moses and we know why because elijah the prototype prophet represents the prophetic tradition and of course moses the greatest judge the greatest constitutional expert and obviously uh, you know the great leader also uh, represents the one that god used to bring israel out of egyptian bondage so moses gave israel direction and led them out of egypt and served as god's mouthpiece telling the people what god had told him and so i want you to understand that moses combining himself a dual role in fact even more than that he was the leader but he was also a judge and to add to that he was also a prophet one of the greatest prophets that had ever arisen in judaism but the task was not easy and we just read it moses being a leader moses being a judge moses being a prophet that was a, a very a big task for him uh, and so it wasn't easy at all the people struggled to trust god they grumbled against god the people of israel grumbled against moses 
and they grumbled against one another did you get that wherever there are people you know this, these things will obviously you know happen they struggled to trust God their own trust was actually uh, in jeopardy they grumbled against God's chosen leader they also grumbled against one another and so as the problems arose among the people Moses tried to carry the load of managing them by himself but thankfully God doesn't want his people to bear their burdens alone you know when I came to this part of the study the, the song uh, one of the hymns that uh, we all know very well I must tell Jesus all of my trials and troubles and tribulations he is a friend a compassionate friend one that goes through all my troubles with me and he will never he will never leave me or abandon me and so you can see God did not abandon his chosen uh, leader Moses as Moses tried to resolve all the issues tried to help the people of Israel uh, you know God was with him even though it was killing him could you imagine Moses doing this all by himself from what we read but God was there with him and God didn't want Moses to bear that burden alone tonight I want you to know that you are not alone in the burdens which you bear the troubles and the trials and the tribulations that you go through I want you to know that you are not alone we serve a risen Savior and he is in the midst of all the troubles and trials with us just as he did with his servant Moses tonight I want you to have this assurance and this confidence in yourself that you are not alone and that in the troubles and in the trials that you encounter God is there with you as God was with Moses and so when Moses' father-in-law came to him as we just read the first thing that Moses did was to recount all the miracles and all the great things that God had done for his people and you saw the reaction of Jethro he rejoiced he was happy when Moses told him about all that God had done for Israel God's works are a blessing not only to those who experience them at first hand but also to those who hear them let me say that one more time when God does something for you of course you receive that blessing you enjoy it but I want you to share that blessing with others because when you share that blessing others also get to know Jesus Christ and get to know the you know the Lord and so that's exactly what Moses did he shared that the blessings that God had bestowed on Israel and of course Jethro rejoiced with him Jethro wasn't part of it, but he rejoiced. Remember, he was the priest of Midian. Uh, uh, and yet he rejoiced when he heard the blessings that God had bestowed upon Israel. Tonight, I don't want you to keep your blessings you know, to yourself. The more you share, the more God continues to bless us. And it is true. We know the analogy with the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is there to collect all the water, but it doesn't give out. So it's dead. When God blesses you, share that blessing with others. Be a conduit through which God's blessings will flow to other people. Because the more God blesses you, the more God expects you to bless others. And that's exactly what we are talking about here. You see, what we know uh, with the people of Israel was that in spite of all of this, they continue to grumble. They continue to complain. And so the question I want to pose to all of us tonight is, are we different from the people of Israel? Are we different from the Israelites? I don't think so. For two reasons. We are like the Israelites in our propensity to complain because we share the same core problem, namely sin. We are like the Israelites in our propensity to complain because we share 
the same core problem. The same problem. And that problem is sin. We complain because it is our nature to do so. But also, secondly, we also cannot miss what Moses did and what Moses you know, did not. You see, Moses, that great leader, that great constitutional expert, who we will talk about more next week, did not give in to this sinful inclination to complain. Yes, he told Jethro of the hardships that they had experienced in the wilderness. But it was not with the spirit of complaining, but to show God's faithfulness and God's goodness through all the trials and tribulations that they endured in the wilderness. And so when you share your blessing, even when you have experienced some you know, problems in your life, you still have to extol, you still have to bless God's faithfulness and God's goodness to you. So Moses refused to follow in the way of the people that he led. He did not complain to Jethro about what it was like to lead such a stubborn, ungrateful people. To Moses, the story that deserved to be told centered on God and his faithfulness rather than on the Israelites and their faithlessness. The story that we should share with people should be on God's faithfulness and God's goodness to us. My dear friends, you are blessed. If you look at other people, I think you should say, God, thank you for what you have. And through that, be encouraged to bless those who are less fortunate than you are. If you look in your life, you will see how blessed you are. God has blessed us and God wants us to have this understanding that in all that we do, God is there to bless us. So let me pose this question to all of us. What does complaining say about our hearts? What does complaining say about us and about our Christian lives and about the God that we serve? I want you to be kind of thinking through this and discussing this you know, at the end of my lesson with your family. What does complaining say about you, about your family, about uh, your spouse, about our own Christian you know, work, about our relationship with God? Let me offer you some suggestions, and I know you'll come up with some very great answers. What does complaining say about our heart? Well, for me, complaining shows that I am self-focused. It's all about me. I am self-centered. Because what I'm complaining is usually complaining about my life, how unfortunate, how unblessed I am, how other people are doing well. God, don't you see that person who is not even a follower of, of, of yours and yet look at how blessed they are. Look at how prosperous they are. And you know, this question is not, is not new. People have asked this question over and over and we are in the same trap because of what I said at the beginning, the sin problem, that propensity to complain because we share the same core, the same human core which is the sin in a problem. And so we are all self-focused. We are all self-centered. And that's why we complain. We do not trust the sovereign Lord. That's another reason why we complain. We do not trust the sovereign God, the good God who works all things together for our good. We complain because we are self-centered. We complain because we don't trust the God who made us in the first place. The God who is always working out good for us. The God who knows who we are and is always prepared to bless us. We believe, the third reason why we complain, we believe our plans and expectations are higher than God. That's another reason why we complain. Is that all right? We believe that the plans that we've made, our expectations, they are well organized. And you know, I've said this before, here in America, we don't want to not be in control. We want to know that we are in charge, which is good. 
But I think, in some sense, it also does adversely affect our relationship with God. Sometimes it's good to let go and let God be in charge. While we need to make plans, while we need to do what we have to do because God made us with the capacity to think, to do, to be, to act, we also need to know that at the end of it all, it's all about God. It's not about us. And so we need to let go and let God take charge. And so these are three of the reasons why we complain. Because we are self-centered, which is not good. Because we do not trust the sovereignty of God and God's goodness for us. God's you know, will to do us good. We don't trust God. That's why we want to take things into our own hands. And thirdly, because we believe in our own plans and in our own expectations. We believe that they are higher, even better planned and obviously better executed than what God can do for us. Well, my Christian friend, tonight's lesson is drawing our attention to this problem. That when we don't focus on God and trust God enough, we think that we can do things for ourselves. And we know from history that invariably it leads and it ends in disaster for us. There's also another thing that God did for Moses, which I want us to uh, take a cue and draw some lessons from. Wise leaders challenge others. In fact, when you read from verse uh, 13 to verse 23 uh, in Exodus 18, you notice how Jethro's wisdom in confronting Moses was, well, you know, it was reasonable. But his counsel also did come with some, you know, not without some risk. Remember, Moses was God's appointed leader. And I've said at the outset that Moses was not only a judge, but he was also a prophet. Combining those two offices and God taking Moses and God appointing him to lead Israel. And so Jethro came with some trepidation there because he was going to speak and offer counsel to the one that God had handpicked. And I want you to hear me out clearly here. You see, I think here, Jethro was reminding Moses that Moses was not superhuman. Yes, I'm a pastor. I'm an ordained pastor. But that does not make me superhuman. Yes, we have our elected officers. But that doesn't make, you know, mean that they are superhuman, that they don't err, that they don't make mistakes. Remember, Moses was a judge. Moses was a prophet. Moses was God's anointed and appointed leader. But that didn't make him superhuman. Moses was not immune from all the things that we also experience and go through. I think this is a tremendous lesson that we need to take to heart. You see, we need to know that we need help from others. That Moses, as far as Jethro was concerned, was making a tactical mistake in his leadership. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, as you observe Moses sitting down there and trying to arbitrate and trying to kind of, uh, you know, uh, resolve all the issues, he saw how Moses was wearing himself out almost to the point of death. Even though Moses was a giant, Moses was God's anointed, God's appointed leader. And Moses was God's prophet. You see, Moses needed to hear what he, Jethro, had to say, both for Moses' own good and for the good of God's people. So Jethro took the risk and counseled his son in law. My Christian friends, there is a time. And place for us to offer helpful advice when we see an area of weakness in someone else. Let me say that one more time. There is a time and place for us to offer helpful advice or wise counsel when we see an area of weakness in someone else, in a Christian brother or sister. But also, just as there is a time and place for us to receive helpful counsel and advice when we see a weakness in us. 
when others see a weakness in us, we should be humble enough to also receive counsel. Just as we should be able, in love and in humility, offer counsel and help to somebody that we see, you know, is erring. And again, you know this in Matthew chapter 18. You know, Matthew gives us what to do when we see some uh, uh, Christian brother or sister going, uh, you know, out of, uh, you know, out of line. But ourselves also, we should know that there is a time and place for us to receive helpful advice when others see a weakness in us. Some of us are quick to advise others, but we are very slow to receive advice from other people. Well, it cuts both ways. Remember, God's word is a double-edged sword. This is the heart of the biblical imagery of iron sharpening iron. So let me read to your hearing from the wise man, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 27. is a, a, you know, a, a, a verse that we all know very well. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17. Iron sharpens iron. And one man sharpens another. And so as we advise someone, we should also be humble enough to receive counsel when others see uh, a weakness or some defect in our character. You know, um, as I was preparing this uh, study, uh, you know, something just occurred to me about an incident that you know, took place in the New Testament. A, a situation that is similar to what we're reading or uh, what we're saying right now. Uh, you see um, where a leader uh, was willing to challenge another leader. And uh, just as Jethro was willing to challenge his son-in-law, who was a leader, a judge, and a prophet. We see another instance where Paul confronted Peter, also known as Cephas. After Peter withdrew from fellowship with Gentiles, or with Gentile Christians because of the presence of uh, uh, Jewish Christians from Jerusalem. You can read about this in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. You know, just as Jethro was able to offer his son-in-law this uh, you know, lesson, we also see Paul, when he saw Peter dissembling and Peter doing something that wasn't right, Peter was eating with the Gentile Christians when the uh, Jewish Christians were not there. But as soon as some of the Jewish Christians came from Jerusalem, Peter then stepped aside. And in fact, that action of Peter was infectious. In fact, it also affected uh, those who were with Peter. I think I better read that to your hearing. And this is from uh, you know, Galatians uh, chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, you can read this. Uh, you know, on your own uh, after this, you know, lesson. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to uh, uh, 14. Let me read that, you know, to your hearing you know, quickly. But when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself fearing the circumcision party. In other words, fearing the Jews because circumcision, obviously every Jew had to be circumcised. Now, Peter who was circumcised was now in company with the uncircumcised, with Gentile Christians. And so when the Jews, his Jewish Christians came, he stepped aside and Paul saw that as hypocritical. So here's what Paul, you know, uh, said and advised him in verse 13. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Peter so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, let me read that one more time, verse 14. But when I, Paul, saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before all of them, if you Though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul called him out. And he called him out for the good of the gospel. And so, 
when we see our erring brother, we should be, you know, humble enough, also with courage, but in love, be able to just talk with them. Equally, when they see a defect, they see some kind of uh, area in our lives, that, a weakness that needs to, um, you know, be worked upon, we should receive them uh, again in love and, and listen to them. And so what did Moses do? As we bring our study to a close, we, just, we read from, again, Exodus chapter 18. What did Moses do? And let me read that to your hearing one more time, what Moses did when uh, his uh, father-in-law uh, came there and, uh, and offered him that wise counsel. So Moses, verse 24 of chapter 18 of Exodus, So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. In the hard case, they brought to Moses. But in a small matter, they decided themselves. Did you get that? And so what would happen to Moses? He would have some time to rest. So, let's put it all together. Moses heeded the wise counsel of his father-in-law. And in fact, when you go back to chapter 17 of uh, Exodus, there is a story of uh, Moses experiencing the help of others. Let me summarize that for you. You can read that in Exodus chapter 17. The Israelites on their way from Egypt, after they crossed the Red Sea, they actually um, uh, uh, came into some conflict with the Amalekites. And because Moses received help from others, the outcome was positive. What happened was that in the battle with the Amalekites, the Israelites prevailed while Moses' arms were raised by Aaron and Hur, H-U-R. But anytime Moses' arms went down, the Amalekites began to win the battle. I think I better read it because it's kind of, uh, you know, interesting. Um, let me read from uh, Exodus chapter 17 uh, from verse uh, uh, 8. And this is uh, actually what, uh, you know, happened. Then Amalek, they, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the mountain. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Let me say that one more time. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, you know, hand or arm, the Amalekites prevailed. But there came a time when Moses grew weary. He got tired. So what did the people of Israel do? Mo, you know, Aaron and Hur, H-U-R, these two men propped up the arm of Moses. And so Moses was able to get some help. And as long as the hand or the arm of Moses was held up, Israel began to win. And ultimately, Israel won the battle. Israel became victorious. You see, Moses should have learned a lesson, but he did not, or he couldn't on his own. He needed someone else, like Jethro, to come and help him see it. So, let me conclude with what I call the Jethro principle. Jethro's principle of leadership impacts more than national governments, it seems to me. It informs leadership in a more important arena, namely our churches. The ministry of the gospel is an enormous task of eternal importance, of eternal consequence. Therefore, God designed the church to function following a Jethro-like model, a Jethro-like principle, namely, we share the burdens of ministry with each other as we work together to build up the body of Christ, preserving the unity of the church and glorifying God. 
as people see us work together in unity, humility, and love. And so let me leave you with this Jethro-like principle. And that is, we need each other. We share our burdens together. So my Christian friend, if somebody points out your mistake, don't be upset. If somebody, if you point out a mistake for another person, they should embrace it. But it takes humility and love for us to trust each other and to build relationships. But if we live with this Jethro-like principle, what it does is it preserves unity of the body of Christ. And when people see that we are united and we are in one mind doing the work of God, it brings glory to God. And it also leads people to come to join us. And we can only do that in unity, in humility, and in love. May God bless us that through this Wednesday night study, as we go through this Holy Week, we will take to heart this Jethro-like principle in which we offer counsel to others and we allow them to offer counsel to us. Let's heed the counsel that we give to one another because in doing that, we build bridges, we build unity, we preserve the unity of the body and we also in humility and in love, we glorify God and others will come to know the blessings of God and call Jesus the blessed one. May God bless you as uh, we bring this to a close and I hope that you've learned and you've gleaned something from this Wednesday night Bible study. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Master, we thank you so much for this study of Exodus chapter 18 and for the wise counsel that Jethro offered his son-in-law Moses, the greatest leader ever. Lord, as people of God, we are called to be leaders, but at the same time in humility and in love, we should be able to receive and accept you know, counsel from others just as we are able to counsel others. And together, Lord, may we glorify your name and may we lead others to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that, Father, you will keep us safe and keep our families safe and keep our great land safe and keep the world safe as we battle this you know, virus. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you Tomorrow, 6.30 for our uh, Monday, Thursday service. Please, you know, join us and uh, just encourage your family and friends. You can call them and let them tune in. Uh, again, it's very simple. You don't have to have a Facebook account. All that you do is you just go to Parkwood website and just scroll down. Where, where it says put in your Facebook account, just ignore that. You go down and you see uh, a link where you just, you know, uh, hit and that will take you uh, to uh, our service. We hope that you, you will be able to join us and of course we look forward to having a great time on the Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. May God bless you.